Have you ever had a night where you couldn't sleep because you were thinking too hard? I remember having too much fun about the stuff I was researching back in 2020 that I would just stay up and walk around talking to myself. Cut to 2023 and I'm ranting to my friend how long it has been since I have felt that. Since a problem has devoured my waking hours and consumed my focus so much that I couldn't stop thinking about it. This video is a story about how that math problem came from an unexpected place. How I introduced this problem to others which sparked a really lovely discussion. And how we, with some effort, found a really nice counting formula and how at the end of the day, a friend of mine found an absolutely beautiful proof of it. So this video is an educational math video about comics with vibes of a diary entry. So let me tell you a little bit about my life. First, let's talk about comics. Last semester I was taking a course on comics. It was almost enlightening to see how far beyond the Sunday comic strips the medium extends. In the course we covered the highly political history of comics, discussed the theory of interplay of words and images, and read multiple comics that made me cry. After this, we had to do a final project, which you guessed it, was to make our own comic. I had seen a lot of writers challenge the idea of what a comic means, and I thought maybe I could tackle it in my own way. Put loosely, a comic is a sequence of images put together. See that over there? No, not the fly. Ugh. I'm talking about the word sequence. This word refers to how panels in comics follow each other. For example, consider this Garfield comic. There's a clear way to read it, from left to right, as that's how the panels are laid out. To take a more involved example, for instance, take this page from X-Men Dark Phoenix. The panels are not laid out quite in a line, but the reader can still find their way around the page, going from one panel to the next. Keep this at the back of your mind, because we are going to break this rule to make 2D comics. One day, my friend was making these paper people chains, and she handed me one of those accordion fans. As my idle hands flipped through the pages, I was struck by an idea. What if there was a comic which you would read normally from left to right, but it would be possible to unfold a panel outwards to have another comic within, like a comic made out of comics. As the reader in this case has two directions to read the comic in, I thought the name 2D Comics would fit. Then peak laziness hit and I thought maybe I don't have to go through the trouble of making this panel unfold, but I can just represent the two directions by drawing the inner comic below the panel. So, now people could read it like this. Then it struck me, if people can go down while reading, what's stopping them from going right again? And what if they could? Could I create a comic that would allow the reader to go right and down while reading as they please? And what if all these ways to read a comic were valid? And how would one make such a comic coherent? So, in conventional comics, most often if you're looking at a panel, there is a unique panel right after that. If we draw arrows indicating the direction of reading, most comics would look like this. A 2D comic, on the other hand, would look something like this, with maybe multiple panels leading to the same panel, but more importantly, with a single panel being followed by possibly multiple panels. This idea has its precedence in like choose your own adventure stories and those poems you can read forwards and backwards. This thing that we have just made is called a directed graph. These are also called quivers because you know they are collections of arrows. If there is a comic that can be read in this particular fashion, then we will call this the quiver of that comic. The quiver of the comic I wanted to make looks like this, with all its downwards and rightwards choices. Here. Take a look at this panel. Narratively, it comes after this one and this one. And that's it. So all I have to do is make sure that the narrative is coherent across these arrows and the comic as a whole should work. So for every panel, I just have to make sure it follows from two panels and that should make the whole comic readable. In math, we call this idea of just looking at a small part and making it make sense a local rule. And as you can see, by just satisfying the local rule, we get something on a global scale. In our case, the comic. For those of you who know about the Pascal's triangle, its construction also follows some local rules. For even fewer of you who know about Fermi growth diagrams, again, by just following local rules, we can create something coherent on a global scale. 
In practice, of course, I had to be slightly more aware than the local rules to make the jokes work and hold the narrative. But all in all, this idea of local rules did most of the heavy lifting. And I think it was decently successful. I have linked the comic I made in the description below. And you know, tell me what you feel about it in the comments. And remember to read it in multiple ways, going down and right as you desire. Huh, multiple ways I say. But how many exactly? While writing up my final project, I didn't just want to say hundreds, but I actually wanted to give a precise number. So, I think we have bumped into a counting problem. And the Combinatorics Manifesto says that if you find yourself face to face with a counting problem, you must at least attempt to solve it. I guess we don't have a choice now. Say we start with a grid of boxes with M boxes going this way and N going down. Each sequence of down and right steps draws a path which we'll call a lattice path. Here are some examples. As you can see, each lattice path gives us a way to read and thus gives us a new comic. Some of you might have the question if each lattice path really gives us a new comic. I have tried to address that in the description. For the moment, we will take it such that each lattice path gives us one comic and each comic comes from one lattice path. We can now rephrase our comics counting problem in terms of counting lattice paths. For an M by N grid, how many lattice paths can one make? Suppose we change the problem a little. Start with a 3 by 4 grid and instead of having our paths start and end at arbitrary points, we start from this corner and end at the opposite corner. You will see that all the lattice paths that you draw under this constraint have exactly 5 steps. Why should that be? Well, I'll let you think about that for a while. This is because in any case, you'll have to take 2 steps rightwards to reach the right edge and 3 steps down to reach the bottom edge. So the only thing that changes between paths is the order in which we take these steps. Let us denote taking the right step by the letter R and the downward step by the letter D. I realized while editing that I had messed up the rows and columns. So now we'll consider a grid with three columns and four rows. Sorry. By putting two R's and three D's together, we form a word which represents our path symbolically. In this case, we want to make a word of length five to symbolize our five step path. Note that once we decide the positions of R's, the down steps are automatically decided. So out of five spots, we choose two where R goes and then we fill in the D's. The number of ways to do this is given by the binomial coefficient five choose two. Uh, so if you're a little rusty on binomial coefficient and what the symbol means, I've linked a video by Matt Parker explaining the concept. You can watch that and come back to this video. The gist is, in general for an A by B rectangle, we have A minus 1 steps going to the right and B minus 1 steps going down. So the number of paths we have is given by A minus 1 plus B minus 1 choose A minus 1, which is equal to this. We now know how to count lattice paths that join diagonally opposite vertices of a rectangle, but how do we use this to solve the general problem? Well. Each lattice path is contained in an invisible rectangle with vertices as endpoints. For example, to make sure this lattice path is counted, we make this rectangle. So if we take all possible rectangles in the grid and count each corner to corner lattice path in them, then we would have counted all lattice paths in our grid. Let's go over this again because it's important. We want to count all possible lattice paths. One way to go about this is to count lattice paths by endpoints and consider all possible pairs of endpoints. The problem of counting lattice paths that start here and end here is the same as counting lattice paths in this rectangle. So if we take all possible rectangles that fit in our grid, we will have counted all lattice paths. In an M by N grid, how many A by B rectangles can you fit? I suggest you try it out for yourself first by taking a 5 by 7 grid and sliding a 2 by 3 rectangle around. Did you get the answer as 20? For the general case, you can fit m minus a plus 1 
times n minus b plus 1 rectangles and each of these rectangles gives us a plus b minus 2 choose a minus 1 paths by changing a and b with a going from 1 to m and b going from 1 to n then adding all of these up gives us the total number of paths if you look at it it is definitely neat sum but it's not a proper formula what i wanted was an expression where i could just plug in m and n and get the number of paths without doing all of these sums i try to obtain this formula by simplifying the sum but i was stuck so i did what any self-respecting graduate student does when they're stuck So I wrote up the question and asked if the sum could be simplified. We had a couple of near, sometimes far misses, but the good thing was that people were thinking about the problem and were definitely interested in knowing if there was a simple, satisfying answer at the end of this. Here's an insider peek into how a mathematician might go about tackling this problem. The OEIS, the Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences, is a repository of sequences that come from all corners of mathematics. So your Fibonacci sequence, sequence of primes, sequence of abundant numbers are all here. Say, you're working on a problem and are stuck. One way to get out of the rut is to find a sequence related to what you're studying and look it up on the OEIS. Often, you'll find a relevant formula or it will give you some idea about the relation of your object of interest to something that is already known. It is like a fingerprint database for mathematical objects. So if the sequence you found matches the one here, you can get some good evidence for how your object of study might be complicit in the crime. So that approach was tried and someone did find the right sequence, but unfortunately not a formula. And as the afternoon turned to evening, there it was. Someone after spending some good time on it had finally smoothed the summation into a nice neat looking formula. This inspired me to give another shot at computing this formula for myself. So, the next day after a lot of scribbles on the whiteboard and inhaling enough marker to allow me to knock out a small horse, I had finally found the formula which exactly matched the one found before. It required a lot of symbolic manipulation and a generous use of this thing called the hockey stick identity. In the Pascal's triangle, if you want to sum these numbers, their sum is given by this number, which you know, sort of makes a shape like a hockey stick. Combinatorialists are great at giving things names. And time for the grand reveal. So here's the formula. Just look at it, it's adorable. Even with this triumph in our hands, something was bugging me. And not only me, but also everyone involved in this. The journey to this formula required so much algebra and symbolic manipulation. While in the beginning there were only paths and pictures, was there a direct proof that avoids all these sums and just uses paths? I know I have spoiled this already and the answer is yes. But trust me, you need to take a look at it. It's gorgeous. Before I show you the proof, let's think about why we should expect a proof just based on paths. Looking at the newly obtained formula, we see this big binomial coefficient. We saw that paths are counted by binomial coefficients, but and this is the holy grail of counting, a binomial coefficient can be interpreted as a path counting problem. You see this theme all across combinatorics. You study some objects, which you come up with a counting formula for, but on some other day you're doing something else entirely, sometimes even in a different field of math, and you see this formula in the wild. This tells you that what you're doing right now is somehow related to those previous objects which gave birth to the formula. In a sense, it is equally important to translate back from accounting formula to recover the pictures. This forwards and backwards correspondence is what makes combinatorics such a rich and creative field. Now back to the formula. Our m times n grid has m minus 1 right steps and n minus 1 down steps. But in the big binomial coefficient, we see that we have a m plus 1 plus n plus 1 on the top. So it means it has something to do with a grid with m plus 1 right steps and n plus 1 down steps. So, this means it's a grid of m plus 2 by n plus 2. Let's make that. This counts paths starting at this corner of a new grid and ending at this corner. We will call these paths long paths. This subtraction of terms tells us that we are over counting something and so there are less lattice paths than there are long paths. 
What we will now do is construct a lattice path out of a long path. Here's the genius of the proof. Mark the first and the last time that the long path changes its direction in the inside grid. Call these points as pivots. Okay, let me say it again. Look at the inside grid, see when the long path takes a turn, and mark the first and the last points to find our pivots. Now, keep only the part of the path between the pivots and erase all else to make the lattice path. You can also see that if we had started with a lattice path instead, it's easy to reconstruct the long path from which it came from. Now we see how a long path can give us a lattice path. So, what is it that we are actually overcounting? Well, it's possible that a long path does not take a turn in the inside grid at all. So, there is no lattice path corresponding to such a long path. And how many long paths do we need to remove? Long paths like this snake along the edges, then go straight inside the grid, hit the edge, and then go to the other vertex. Except the last two which don't go inside at all. Once the path turns for the first time in this case, the rest of its trajectory is already determined. So the only choice we really have is in choosing the point where the first turn happens. There are a total of m plus n plus 2 options, so we remove that many. The binomial coefficient also counts paths which have zero length, which are basically this. Every box in our original grid gives us a zero length path, so there are m times n many of them. But two long paths give us one zero length path, so there are two times m times n of them. To settle this difference, we subtract by m times n. So now doing a little algebra, which is almost nothing in front of what we went through before, gives us the formula. And finally, we can now settle our question. For the 5x5 comic strip I made, there are 887 ways to read it, and 862 if you don't consider single panels as comics. So feel free to go ahead and tell me in the comments which out of these 800 odd ways was your favorite. There's my story about a little problem that consumed my time, that came from a place I could have never imagined, and the one that made me realize how much fun doing math with people is. There are lots of caveats and discussions that I've relegated to the depths of the doobly-doo, which you can check out. Thanks for watching.